Hi, my name is Mo Chen, and for those of you who are new to this channel, this channel is all about sharing my knowledge and skills that I've acquired over the years as a data analyst. For those of you who are not new to this channel, thank you so, so much for watching and subscribing. I never even thought that I could get over a thousand subscribers, and at the time of this recording, I have over 2,000 subscribers on this channel. So the fact that you're engaging, subscribing, listening and watching means so, so much to me. So I just want to say a big thank you to you all who have been watching and subscribing. Thank you so, so much. I'm going to try my best to keep on delivering great content going forwards. In today's video, I'm going to show you how I explore data using Python in a Jupyter Notebook as a data analyst. I'm not going to type out the code from scratch, but what I will do is I'll go through the more complex codes. In more detail, I'm going to break it down so you can easily understand what's going on. We're also going to answer some questions within this exercise, and there's going to be some questions that I will not answer in this video, so you can attempt it by yourself at home. But don't worry if you don't know the solution, because there's a link below to the GitHub repository that will contain the data file, the exercise file, and the solution file. First things first, let's import all of the necessary libraries that we'll be using. So we'll use the NumPy, the Pandas, the matplotlib, Seaborn, and aliases libraries. Underneath that, I'm using percent matplotlib inline to make the plots appear directly below the cell. And then after that, I'm actually using this for loop to find the correct encoding that I can use to read in my CSV file. I'm using this because by default, pandas will use UTF-8 encoding, which in this case um, will not work, unfortunately. So let me just show you that it doesn't actually work. So if I just go pd.read csv crime.csv, you see that I get an error message. So it doesn't work which is why I need to find the correct encoding. Essentially, what's happening here is just that I'm importing the aliases library, which contains a dictionary of the encoding names that we can use. And then within that, I'm going to print out the ones that I can actually use for this file. So I'm saying successful and then print out the encoding name. And within here, I'm only reading in the first 10 rows to make my code run quickly and efficiently. So let me just run that. And then you see all of these encodings that we can use to read in our crime.csv file. So next up, I just chose one of these encodings, ISO 885911, and I'm reading in my crime.csv CSV file. After that, I'm using crime.head to quickly check out the table, the beginning of the data frame. You can see all of the columns, you can scroll through and check out the values. Underneath that, I'm using crime.shape to check out the shape of the data frame. So it returns two values. The first one is the number of rows. So we can see that we have 319,073 rows and 17 columns within this data frame. And then I'm using uh, crime.duplicated.sum to find the number of the duplicated rows. So let me just break this code down. So let me just uh, show you what crime.duplicated would give you first. So this will give you a false or a true, depending on whether or not the row is a duplicated row. And then by summing them, you're just summing the true values. And this is equal to 23. Next up, we're going to drop the duplicates. And I'm using in place is equal to true because I want to make my changes permanent. So after running the cell, I'm using crime.shape to check the shape of the data frame again. And you see here now that we're only left with 319,050 rows. So we have successfully removed 23 rows. Now let's dig a little bit deeper and really explore the data set. Again, you can use crime.head to print out the beginning of the data frame, and then you can use the tail function to check the end of the data frame, or you could just simply use crime, and then you can see the beginning and the end of the data frame. Pandas by default will give you 10 rows of data, but you can change this by specifying the options. So you could say, for example, change this to be equal to six. And then if I run crime again now, I'm only left with six rows of data. Let me just change this back to the default so it's equal to 10. And then let me print crime again. And you see we're left with 10 rows of data again. Next up, I'm using the dot info function to get some summary information about the data frame. So you get the column back, you get the non-null counts, and then the data type of the column. So if we just look at incident number, for example, we can see that it's got no missing values. So we have 319,050 non-null values, and then it's of object data type. We can look at um, shooting, for example, we can see that we only have 1019 non-null values, which uh, to me suggests that it's either a yes or a blank. 
And then we can look at uh, a curd on date, for example, which uh, also has no missing values and is of object data type now. But in the next line, we are going to convert this column here into a date time column. So we're doing this because we want to be able to easily extract date time information from the column, and we can only do so if it's a date time column. So I'm using the to date time function here to convert my column, and then I'm using crime.info again to see if it has worked. And you see here occurred on date now is of date time, and this is what we wanted because now we can extract any kind of date time information. So here I'm extracting the year. Next up, I'm going to extract the month. Next up, I'm going to extract the week and then the hour and then the minute, so on and so forth. So you see how useful this is to extract any kind of date time information. Next up, I'm using the describe method to get some information on the numeric columns. And then underneath that, I'm using the option include object to get summary information on the non numeric columns. So let's quickly have a look at the output of this and how we could interpret this. So say, for example, if I look at the incident number column here, we have 319,050 values, but we only have 282,517 unique values, which suggests uh, to me that we have duplicate incident numbers, which is okay, because there might be multiple types of uh, crimes committed or multiple types of uh, offenses committed within a single incident. We can also look at the district column here. For example, we can see that we have 12 unique districts and the most frequently occurring one is B2 and it occurs 49,940 times. Or we could look at reporting area, for example, and we have 879 distinct unique reporting areas. Um, we could also look at shooting. Like we said before, we have 1019 non null values. We have only one unique value, which is just a yes flag. So it's either a yes or it's a blank. Next up, we can look at day of week, for example, we have seven unique values, which makes sense because we have days running from Monday to Sunday. And then Friday is the most frequently occurring day. Moving on, we can print the columns within our data frame just by using the dot columns method. So you have all of the columns returned. And then next up, I'm actually going to check for columns with missing values here. So once you use numpy.sum, you can sum up the values within the column and then you make the value not equal to zero because you want the values to be missing. And then you slice your crime.columns according to this criteria here, which returns district, shooting, UCR part, street, latitude and longitude as the missing values. So to break this code down just a little bit, let me start with crime.isNull first. And this will just return you a data frame with trues and falses depending on whether or not the value is missing. So now we can use numpy.sum, so np.sum, and I'm going to sum these values. And then now you get the missing values in each of the columns. You can make this not equal to zero because you want columns with missing values. So you want to retain the true ones and then you use crime.columns and then you make sure you slice this list according to this criteria. And this is how you end up with these column names here. Now, of course, you can check for the columns with no missing values. So all you would have to do is make this equal to zero. And then there you go. These are the columns with no missing values. Next up, I'm using a simple for loop to check for the number of unique values in each of the columns. And then I am going to print out the column name and then uh, has how many and then unique values. And that's it. That's the for loop that I'm running here. And then it's just an easy way to check for unique values. So like I said before, day of week has seven unique values. Hour here has 24 unique values. Again, it makes sense because we have 24 hours. Month has 12 unique values and then we also check reporting area 879 unique values. And then uh, we also have 12 unique districts. Moving on to answering some questions, some exploratory questions using this data. So question number one is what are the most common crimes in terms of offense groups? So I'm using a really helpful uh, function here, value counts. And value counts will just give you the counts of each of these values. So we can see that we have 37,130 two counts of uh, motor vehicle accident responses, uh, 25,935 counts of uh, larceny, and then medical assistance, investigate person, so on and so forth. Next up, 
with this piece of code here, offense group vals, I'm just getting the top 10 values out of uh, offense code group dot value counts. And I'll show you how I got that. So let me just print value counts again. So all I'm doing here is I'm going to slice this list to only include the first 10 values. And there you go. This is it. Next up, I'm going to display the offense group vals as a percentage of the total crimes. And I'm using crime.shape and I'm picking the first element of that because I want to divide by the total row numbers that we have within the data set. So just to refresh our memory, crime.shape gives me 319,050 rows and 17 columns. And I want to get the rows out of this. So I'm just picking the first element, which is 319,050. So I'm going to print this out and I'm creating a bar chart after that with the same values. So let me just run this. And there you go. We have all of these values as a percentage of total crimes. And then we have the same in this uh, bar chart as well. Okay, so moving on, what are the least common offense groups? So almost the same piece of code, but at the end, I'm going to sort the values ascending and then I'm picking the first 10 values. So there you go. You can see that burglary human trafficking, which is quite bad, very bad, actually, biological threat, investigate person and uh, human trafficking, so on and so forth. These were the least common offense groups. Moving on, it's the first question for you to answer at home. Make sure you try and attempt it. I do have the solution in the GitHub repository as well. So have a go at it and then check the solution. So question number one, what are the most common offense descriptions? And I provided a little hint here. You can use the value counts method here. And then question number two for you, uh, you can try and create a bar chart of the top 10 offense descriptions as a percentage of the total crime. So very similar to what we just uh, saw right here in uh, this field. So we were looking at top 10 offense groups. So now you're going to be looking at top 10 offense descriptions. Make sure you have a go at it. OK, so let's move on to our next question within this video, which is in which year were the most crimes committed here? It's a little bit different now because I'm grouping by the year first, then I'm counting the incident numbers and then I'm plotting the whole thing as a bar chart and I'm using plt.title to give my bar chart a title, which is number of crimes. And there you go. So the group by method is super helpful when you just want to aggregate. And let me just show you how it works. So I'm going to group by the year. And then you see here what you're creating is actually just a data frame group by object. So you need to choose some kind of aggregation method. You could use uh, sum, for example, and then it would return you a data frame. Or you could use mean, for example, and it would also return something. But in this case, we just want to count the incident numbers. So we're using the count method. And then out of these columns, all I want to return is the incident number, which is why I'm slicing and I'm only choosing the incident number column. And there you go. This is the little uh, table that we have. And this is what is visualized below in the form of a bar chart. And moving on to question number three for you. Are there more crimes committed on specific days? Make sure to use a bar chart to try and answer this question. It'll be quite similar to the group by year here. So make sure you have a go at it at home. And then our next question is, are there more crimes during specific hours? So this time we're going to group by the hour and then we're doing the exact same thing as before, counting and then choosing the incident number column. And we're going to plot this as a bar chart. And when you look at the bar chart, it kind of makes sense when people are not awake. I guess it's maybe too early for a crime between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m. And most crimes happen uh, late in the evening. So after 4 p.m., 5 p.m., 6 p.m., quite a lot of crime uh, at midnight as well, if you can see here. Next up, we're going to answer this question on what days and during which hours are the most crimes committed. So this time, the difference is we're going to group by the hour and the day of the week here. Then we're going to count and then we're picking the incident number column. And then we actually need to unstack our data frame so we can actually use a heat map. So let me just run this code here and then let me just break it down. So crime.group by and then count incident number. We all know what this looks like. So it'll look like this, but this is not a heat map. And that's why we're using the unstack function here. And the moment you unstack it, you see that the days turn into the columns and then the hour itself will be the index. But now 
we have Friday, Monday, Saturday, Sunday. It's random the days in which order they appear. So next up, I'm using this code here to rearrange the column so they actually run from Monday to Sunday. So once I've done that, I'm using Seaborn and Seaborn has a built-in function called heatmap. All you have to pass in is a data frame and then you can choose whatever color map you want. So I went for the sns.qplix palette and then if I run this, I'm going to get a nice heat map and you can see that most crimes occur on Monday and Tuesday and Saturday and Sunday between five and six. If you just uh, look at this heat map quickly. OK, so moving on to two more questions. In which months were the number of crimes below average and in which months on average did the most crimes occur? So now what we're going to do is we're going to use a table representation to do this. So if the value is less than the average crime per month, we're going to highlight the value in blue. So in order to do this first, we need to find the average crime per month. So I'm going to use crime.groupby year and then the month and then I'm going to count and then I'm picking the incident number again. And then I'm just choosing the mean function because I want to return the average. So underneath that, I'm going to print this average crime number and then I'm creating year and month data frame using crime.group by again, I'm going to group by the month and then the year count. And then I'm picking the incident number column and I'm going to unstack this to be able to create a table. Then I have this function underneath. Essentially, all this does is that if my value is less than the average crime, then highlight the value in blue. So after running this, you see the table below here, all of the values that are under 7,976.25 are highlighted in blue. So 4,188, yes, less than the average, 667, 7,935. These are all values that are under the average crime. Now underneath that, we're going to use the apply function to highlight the maximum in a column in dark green. So this function underneath will highlight the maximum value in dark green in a column. So once I run this, you can see that the above chart changed as well. But this is our final chart here. These two charts are exactly the same. So now we have the below average values highlighted in blue. And then we have the maximum value across the years. So in 2015, we have the maximum value of 8,411 highlighted in dark green. And then we also pick the maximum values across all of the columns here, which gets us on to our final question. This might be a little bit of a challenge, but I'm sure if you have a go at it, you can easily do this at home. But don't worry if you can't, because like I said, there's also the solution uploaded in the GitHub repository. So question number four. In which districts were the most crimes committed on a yearly basis? And I left a little hint here. Essentially, just try and use everything you've learned in this video to answer the question. Feel free to use functions, tables, other visuals. There's numerous solutions to this. So if you come up with something uh, way better and something that looks way nicer than my solution, make sure you upload it somewhere leave a link in the comments below. I'd be so happy and so keen to see, you know, what you've come up with. Let me know. I really hope that you'll have a go at the exercises by yourself at home, as learning by doing is probably the best way to learn. If you found this video useful, entertaining, or you like this video, make sure you check out some of my other videos right here. Again, thank you so, so much for watching, engaging, and subscribing. It really means a lot to me. And like I said, I will absolutely do my best to keep on delivering great content. See you in the next one.